Well, hey everybody, we're going to continue talking about momentum, uh, which we introduced in the last lecture. So just to give a little bit of a review, um, we need momentum because there's a lot of situations in which the acceleration is changing as a function of time, and it's not just a constant. Um, this can happen because often forces are changing with time. Um, we gave some examples of that last time. So um, momentum is very useful for, for you know, providing some insight to these types of situations. Um, we talked about the three different types of collisions. So there's a nice link that you can click to, to see this page. There is elastic collisions, um, there is inelastic collisions, and then there's perfectly inelastic collisions. Now, with perfectly inelastic, the two objects will stick together. Um, sometimes this is called completely inelastic. Um, with the difference between elastic and inelastic is that uh, you don't lose any kinetic energy after this bounce. Whereas with inelastic, you do lose a little bit of energy, kinetic energy with, uh, with each bounce. Um, and so over time, you'll find these objects go slower and slower, whether, whereas these ones continue to bounce back and forth. Now, this object uh, is going to gain kinetic energy, object two up here. Um, but the important thing is that the sum of the two kinetic energies, the kinetic energy of object one and object two, um, that is the same both before and after the collision. Whereas here, the kinetic energy of object one plus the kinetic energy of object two um, is larger before the collision uh, than it is after the collision, things like that. So, so the main difference between the three different collisions uh, has to do with uh, the, either the kinetic energy or whether they stick together. Now what I want to do is I want to um, talk about inelastic collisions. Uh, well, sorry, I want to talk about perfectly inelastic collisions just for a second um, because I want to talk about kinetic energy in this case. Um, so, so this slide is from last time, and so there's two objects that, that stick together. Um, there's some, the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two equals the momentum of object one and object two after the collision. Um, because they stick together, we know that the final speeds are the same, and so this part of the equation simplifies to this, which is nice, and we can solve for V, Vf. Uh, and we, by dividing both sides by m1 plus m2, we end up with this. So not too bad. So what I want to do is I want to show you that this equation implies that we're losing kinetic energy through the collision when they stick together. So I want to show you that in the next slide by, by considering a very simple situation in which uh, one object is at rest, there's another object coming, they both have the same mass and they stick together. And I did show this slide last time, but I, I just want to reiterate it because there is a question on the midterm and the final asking, you know, do perfectly inelastic collisions conserve energy? Um, the answer is no. And so here's why. So, um, so the initial momentum of object one here is V sub i. The other object is at rest, so that velocity is zero. We know they stick together and they have some final speed. And we know that because the masses are the, are the same, it's just m plus m. And so this works out to be twice m vf. And we can solve for, for vf, like so. Uh, divide both sides by 2m, essentially. And you get this. So you find that the final speed is uh, the initial speed divided by 2. And if you look at this animation, you can kind of see that that's you can kind of see that that's what's going on. So the speed drops just, it comes in pretty fast, but then the speed slows down some, all right? So let's look at the initial kinetic energy, right? The initial kinetic energy is just, um, the object at rest has zero velocity, therefore zero kinetic energy, but the object coming in has some initial velocity. So this is the initial kinetic energy, one half mvi squared. And we now know that the final kinetic energy um, so that's going to be the combined object, so m plus m is the mass there. v final, we know v final is v initial divided by 2. So we get 1 half times 2m times vi over 2 squared. And so 2, so two squared is 4, 2 over 4 is going to be uh, a half, uh, which means that uh, we're essentially going to get half of this. 
right? So that's just one half MVI squared. This is half of one half MVI squared. And so the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy of the, com of the system has, has decreased as a result of this collision, um, which has to do with the way it sticks together and all that stuff. So, or yeah. So, so again, the point of showing this is that when I ask you in a multiple choice question, do perfectly inelastic collisions lose energy do, after the collision? Yes, they do, and it's not hard to see that that's true, okay? Um, so, of course, the, the other collisions, that's not true. So, elastic collisions, for example, if you add up the kinetic energies, um, initially, uh, it's going to be the same as the sum of the kinetic energies after the collision. And, of course, momentum is also conserved. Momentum is conserved for all three of these, these collisions. Um, so, in the last worksheet, um, so this is some new stuff now. It's not talking about what we did last time. But uh, in the worksheet, um, there was uh, an equation that looked a little bit like this, right? So for the perfect bounce mode of Captain America's shield, um, the, uh, I just sort of gave you, I just said, all right, here's the equation for elastic collisions. Well, one thing's bouncing off the other. One of these things is, is this tank round bullet thing, another one is Captain America, and you've got to figure out what the speed that Captain America is sort of uh, deflected um, because of this bullet. Um, and I just basically gave you the equation. Today I want to do um, mildly annoying work to, to actually show you where these, where these equations come from. So the first thing to say is that these equations are come from solving these equations. Um, specifically for the, the, the second object being at rest. So Captain America was at rest, remember? Um, now, if you want to do it even more generally than that, it is possible to do that. Um, but for us, let's try to keep it simple. Um, and I, so, again, these two equations, the only ingredients to getting these equations are these two equations here. There's, there was even a question on the worksheet that's saying, like, all right, we know that momentum is conserved in this collision, the perfect bounce collision. What else is conserved? Well, that would be the, the total kinetic energy. All right, here we go. So again, we're, our mission is to try to show that, that if I show that if I know what the initial speed of the object coming in is and I know the masses, I can get the final speed of the two objects. So let's start with the momentum, see how far we can get, and then we'll jump over to the energy equation. So, again, our bullet coming in, Captain America is stationary, so the velocity is zero, so that simplifies this a little bit. Um, I always have a little bit of trouble guessing which step is after which step in spite of the fact that I, that I created these slides. I think what we're going to try to do is solve for V2F, because ultimately that's kind of what we're going to, that's one of the things that we want over here. We also want V1F. Um, so we're either going to be solving for V1F or V2F, I forget which one. Um, and uh, so let's, so we subtracted M1 V1F from both sides, that's fine. Um, and then, so that gives us V2F on this side. Factor that out, um, and then maybe we're going to divide by M2. Yep, so we divided by M2. Um, and we, we were able to solve for V2F, which is nice, that's good, it's one of the things we were supposed to find. A problem is that we don't really know what V1F is, but um, in any case, we started from this, so we got something that was ever so slightly more helpful. In other words, if we, if we knew what V1F F was, we could figure out what V2F is from this. Alright, so the next thing we're going to do is look at the energy equation. And what we want to do is we want to put in what we've learned uh, on the previous slide from momentum conservation, which is we know something about V2F now. So we can go ahead and uh, sub that in just a second. Before we do, remember that uh, object 2 is at rest. So the full expression that we need to deal with is actually this one. So it's not quite as bad as this. Um, and again, we know something about V2F, so we can go ahead and sub that into here, right? So that's good. 
So now, now we're now we're in business because now we have an equation. We know what what the initial velocity of object one is, right? Because we're allowed to know that we're not like we're the ones setting up this experiment. We're allowed to know what v one i is, but the hard part is predicting what v one f is, right? Um, so we've subbed that into there. Um, it's starting to look pretty messy, but one thing we can do is we can multiply by two, right? Because there's a one half, a one half, and a one half. So we can multiply by two. Um, so after we factor this out, multiply by two, right? Another thing that we can do is you notice that there's an m1 here and an m1 here and an m even an m1 squared here. Um, we can divide by m1. I think is what we're going to do next. Yep. So we're dividing by m1, and we end up with this. All right, so this is what we've figured out so far. Again, our goal is to solve for v1f. Um, and the way we're going to solve it uh, involves kind of a clever trick. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so this, I think we're going to subtract v1f from both sides, I think. Um, yep, so subtracting v1f from both sides, right? Um, and so now we have v1i squared minus v1f squared over here. We also have v1i minus uh, v1f, the quantity, squared there. So what we can do is we can, um, we can kind of uh, expand this. Um, now here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to multiply. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to factor this out, right? That's right, I had, I had to think about it there. We're gonna factor this out. So this is equivalent to this. I haven't changed anything here. I haven't multiplied both sides by anything. All I'm doing is pointing out that if you multiply this expression out, you really do get V1i squared minus V1f squared. Um, so this is kind of a clever, this is kind of the clever part of it where, um, and because I factored this out, you notice that now there's a V1i minus V1f over here and there's also a v1i minus v1f squared over here, which means I can divide both sides by that. And I end up with this, which I hope you'd agree is much less scary than this. Um, and now what I really want to do is solve for v1f, and so I want to put those on the same side. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to add something. Yeah, I'm going to add m1 over 2, m2, v1f to both sides. So now I have that there, um, and it sort of cancels out here. And I'm going to subtract v1i from both sides until I get this. Um, so we're almost there. I just have to factor this out, right? And then um, there's one more thing I can do, which is uh, so, which is to essentially to multiply the top and the bottom by m2 over m2, if that makes sense. So, so when I do that, uh, then m1 over m2 just becomes m1. And then 1 just becomes m2. So we end up with m1 minus m2. And, this, and the same thing happens at the bottom. m1 over m2 becomes m1. 1 times m2 becomes m2. So we end up with something like this, which is what I told you we were going to get to. So again, the only thing that went into this equation is momentum conservation and the total kinetic energy being conserved. Now we still need to figure out what v2f is, right? Because this is just the, the final speed of one of the objects. So on the Captain America worksheet, this would have been like the bullet bouncing off of Captain America's shield and going in the opposite direction. Um, we still need to know what the velocity of Captain America is. Um, so we can, we, what we can do is we can go back to that momentum equation that we had. And now that we know what V1F is, we can put it into here, right? And then we just solve for V2F. Um, and so we can try to remember how we do that. So there's a trick that we can do in which m1 over m1 plus m2 over m1 plus m2 is one. So a multi, you can multiply anything by one, right? And so I can multiply this side by that um, by one. <laughs> Leave this one the same because multiplying by one it's ridiculous. Um, you don't need to do anything. And then I'm gonna uh, try to fact. I'm gonna try to put this over on that side. So I think I'm gonna subtract that from both sides. Um, I guess there's an m1 there that cancels from both sides. And so now I'm going to add, add this to both sides and end up with this. Yeah, so I add this to both sides. 
because it's M2 that also canceled. I add this to both sides, and instead of getting M1 over M1 plus M2, I get twice M1 over M1, M1 plus M2 times V1i, so, which, it, which is what I told you we were going to get, um, but there it is. So again, the only ingredients that go into this equation are momentum conservation and the conservation of total kinetic energy. I will not make you derive these out on the exam, um, but I feel like it's important to show you where it comes from, uh, just so you, you realize that that's, that's what's going into it. All right. Now the full answer, the full answer, uh, if potent, you know both objects are moving at some speed, um, so in other words, don't don't assume that the second object is at rest. Um, the full answer would be this. So just try to ignore those red lines across it. Um, so what I've, what I've really done is I said, all right, this is the full answer. Um, object two has a speed of zero, so I'm going to set that to zero, which is going to make this whole term zero. Um, but so this is what you get from from the book, um, and I just wanted to show you where it comes from. Now, inelastic collisions. So you might be wondering yourself, like, okay, so I feel like I'm ready for questions on the exam about perfectly inelastic. I feel like I'm ready for questions on the exam about elastic because, you know, basically I take these equations and I apply them to whatever situation that that Chris is uh, giving me. But what about inelastic? What if Chris has has something sneaky? Uh, for inelastic, what would even a question look like on the exam with inelastic collisions? Well, because kinetic energy is not conserved, that means that you can't use um, that energy equation in inelastic collision situations. You can only use momentum conservation because momentum is conserved for all three of those collisions, right? And so the way this would have to work, if I was going to ask you a question, I would basically give you um, there's one equation, which means that I can only have one unknown. So I might give you the initial speeds of two objects, and I might give you the final speed of one object, and need you to tell me what the final speed of the other object would be um, according to momentum conservation. Or I could do something along the lines of saying, all right, well, I'm going to give you all the speeds, and I need you to f tell me what mass 2 is for this situation that makes sense. Those are basically the only questions I can really ask about inelastic collisions, if anyone's curious. All right, so let's talk about some new stuff. Some of that was review, some of that not so much. But um, this is a situation it's called the ballistic pendulum, and th the idea of it is that um, there's some sort of a bullet. Sometimes, sometimes people use a dart. Has a, has a little tip on it that will get stuck in this piece of wood or a piece of foam. And so uh, the dart will get shot and stick into, the, into this thing. And then this is attached to a string. And so it will slide up. And so there's an experiment that some people do. I don't know if this is the exact example number, but I'll have to look into that. There's an experiment that, um, that some people do in their classes where they have this, they kind of fire the dart, it get, becomes embedded and this thing swings upward and you try to figure out what angle that thing swings upward. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to come up with a more fun example. And so I found this, this YouTube video um, from quote unquote the Idaho and show. And um, just before I show it, I just want to say that first of all, the guy in this video uh, clearly knows his stuff. He knows a lot about physics. He knows a lot about um, you know, shooting stuff. Um, so he's, he's a, a pretty sharp guy. I think that um, his YouTube channel, um, the fact that he's a country folk, I think, um, I'm, not, I'm not showing you this video because I'm trying to make fun of any country folk. I think that he's, I think we can kind of laugh with him. I think he likes uh, being in Idaho and living the country life and having people sort of chuckle along with him. So, so but clearly he's, he's quite knowledgeable with what he's talking about. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play this. I have to turn my microphone off and uh, let me do that. Well, good afternoon and welcome back to the Idahoan Show. I, I know I haven't uploaded that many episodes lately. Uh, I've been 
awful busy with some other things and the weather hasn't really been very conducive to outdoor filming. Uh, even today we've had intermittent high winds and more than a few snowflakes in the air, but since when did a little snow and wind stop an Idahoan from doing ballistics experiments? Uh, anyway, today I've got a basic ballistic pendulum for you. Uh, the way this works is I've got a, a target suspended on a rigid arm that swings in a bearing. And as that swings back and forth, it moves the needle on this protractor here. Uh, and the needle has just enough friction that it move, you know, when the arm moves it back, it stays in position. And so it records the maximum angle to which the arm swung. Uh, and what this allows me to do is to measure the kinetic energy that was imparted to the target by the impact of a bullet. And there's a variety of things that we can use this for. There's a variety of tests that I want to do with this later on. But for today, I just wanted to try it out by doing some basic velocity measurements. Specifically, I'm going to be shooting a 44 Magnum round, uh, 240 grain jacketed hollow point bullet with, I believe, 18 and a half grains of 2400 powder behind it. Um, I've actually already shot that round across an electronic chronograph, and so I know that from this gun, uh, it's shooting about 1600 feet per second, plus or minus about 10 or 12 uh, feet per second. So now I'm going to shoot the uh, ballistic pendulum with it a few times and calculate the velocity based on conservation of momentum, and we'll see how close the velocity measurement that I get from this thing compares to what I got from the chronograph. Okay, so I've done the calculations, and based on the average of six shots, I'm getting a velocity of 1,243 feet per second, plus or minus about 20%. Um, so obviously not as precise as the chronograph. Also, assuming the chronograph is nominally perfectly accurate, uh, a little lower than we'd expect, about uh, almost 25% lower than the value that we're getting from the chronograph. Uh, nevertheless, you know, this device, especially when we can calibrate it to chronograph data, um, you know, does give us a, a general measure of the velocity of the bullet. Uh, and a ballistic pendulum like this can allow us to take some types of measurements that we can't take with a regular chronograph, which is what I'll be using it for in future episodes. So it certainly provides at least a basis of comparison to measure relative momentum transfer of different types of bullets. So anyway, I've got big plans for this uh, device coming up uh, with some other ballistic testing that I plan to do, but uh, until then, thanks for watching the Idaho Show. All right, well, I hope that he gets a little, a little bit of a bump of subscribers from all this, but... Um, so, first question, what kind of collision is this most similar to? Okay, um, perfectly inelastic or elastic. Now I don't have inelastic on here because if I did, then it's very tempting to say that, well, that every collision is inelastic because you're losing a little bit of kinetic energy, things like that, to heat or sound, stuff like that. But this is the kind of thing that'll ask on like a midterm because uh, I'm asking sort of uh, most approximately, in other words. Um, so just the fact that we can hear the sound from the collision implies that we're losing some energy to sound, right? So you might wonder if this is, you know, whether this is elastic, but again, most approximately, um, which one is the best choice? Well, the best choice is actually elastic because it is not sticking together. And as I said, you can hear the sound of it, um, but not a ton of energy is lost to sound. So it's mainly just sort of bouncing off of it and then the thing swings upwards um, and that's how you do it. So it's not as if this bullet is getting embedded into a piece of wood or a piece of foam or 
you know, bulletproof vest or something, it's on this thing. So elastic is a pretty good, pretty good answer for what kind of collision this is. Um, and uh, so, so this guy is using um, the velocity of the bullet to, um, he happens to know what the velocity of the bullet is, which is nice. Um, he doesn't actually tell us the mass of the target. So like he's able to infer what the velocity of the bullet must have been from uh, how much the thing swings. Um, but he doesn't actually tell us the mass of the target, which is an important calculation figuring that out. Um, so, so a fun thing we can do is try to figure out what is the mass of the target that's in, that's in that video. Um, so, so there's a before and there's after. Um, there's actually, there's actually going to be three different phases to this that we'll talk about. So, um, there's a, there's a, there's a before, there's a slightly after the thing has been hit by the bullet, and then there's after the time that the thing has been able to swing, to swing, and so we're actually going to break it down into three parts. But initially, according to him, the, the bullet is 1600 feet per second, which you can convert to 488 meters per second. Um, and the mass of the bullet, uh, he doesn't, I don't know that he tells us the mass of the bullet, but according to Wikipedia, the mass of the bullet is probably 15 grams, if you, because he talks about what bullet he's, he's using. Um, and so you can, you know, multiply those two, two things together to figure out how much momentum there is. From the video, the max angle of the pendulum, to me, looks close to 45 degrees. Um, it's somewhere in that range between, you know, 30 and 45, I think. That seems pretty safe to, to me. You can see it there. Um, so we're going to use all this information to try to figure out what the mass of, the, of uh, this pendulum contraption is. And then from the looks of it, the length of the pendulum looks maybe like a meter, maybe half a meter. Let's do a half meter. Okay. All right. Like from here. Yeah. All right. Let's do that. Okay. So we know that momentum is conserved. So again, we're breaking this up into three parts. So there's initial, there's quote unquote final, and then there's after, like definitely final. So quote unquote final. All right. So uh, initially the target's at rest. So that makes life easy, easier at least, um, which gives us this equation. Um, the, let's see, so we got that. Um, the other thing that we know is the energy equation, which again is simpler because of the fact that um, the target is initially at rest. So that gives us that. So we have two options here. We can, because our goal here is to solve for the, the speed of the target at this point. So we have two options here, which is to try to do the algebra here, <laughs> run all these numbers, you know, um, try to figure out what it is that way, or you can just go back two slides and look up, um, use the equations that we derived earlier, uh, which will also be on the equation sheet, right? So the equation sheet method would say, all right, well, if V1 is the bullet and V2 is this contraption that we're shooting, initially V2 is zero. So we can set that to zero. So that makes life easier. And then now we have, now we can use this to calculate uh, the recoil, you know, this velocity of the bullet bounces back, um, um, but importantly, the velocity that the this target gets kicked back. So what's interesting here, I want to point out, so this is just applying the equations that I just showed you. What's interesting here is that, um, you know, which is more massive, the target or the bullet? Clearly the target, the bullet is only like 15 grams, right? So, 15 grams minus something really, really big is going to be roughly just minus something really, really big. Same thing down here, the bullet mass plus the target mass is going to be roughly equal to the target mass because the bullet mass is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the target mass. And so we can approximate these equations kind of like this. You see how we go from, so the bullet's mass is negligible compared to the target, so we can just write the bottom of this thing as m target, right? Same thing down here, the bullet mass is negligible compared to the mass of the target, so the bottom of this thing is mass target. Again, the top of this thing, mass bullet minus mass target, 
the tiger is so much bigger than the bull, we can also neglect it up here. So we end up with this and that. Um, and again, this is really what we were trying to get to of the, the speed of the, the final, the quote unquote final speed of this target. Um, so we kind of have that answer there. What's interesting here is that um, you end up with target over target, which means that the velocity of the bullet uh, after it hits this thing is just going back in the direction that it came with basically the same speed that it did. Um, so that's, which, you know, makes, I think makes a fair amount of sense, right? It's going to bounce back at high speed. So it's going to bounce back at pretty close to the speed that it was uh, coming toward, that it was coming towards it. And then we can go ahead and put in some of the, the numbers here. Um, the bullet is 15 grams, that's 0 0.015 kilograms. We know the initial speed of the bullet. The only thing we don't know is the mass of the target. Um, we also don't know what V, v target, the, the, the speed of the target right after the bullet hits. We, we don't know what that is, but we can try to figure it out from the fact that this uh, swings up to 45 degrees. So let's let's see if we can figure this out from the fact that it swings up at 45 degrees, All right? So we got about as far as we could here, All right? So the pendulum swings up to about 45 degrees. So again, this is the quote unquote final. This is sort of the very end where the thing slides up, stops and turns back. So this is the max angle. So this thing is going to be swinging up kind of like that, there's going to be some max angle involved. And because it started, I'm talking about the top of this thing. The top of this thing is is uh, 0.5 meters from the hinge here. And so the top of this thing goes from here to here. Right, because if you look closely, it's the top of this thing that I'm measuring at 0.5. And so this thing is going to have a change in height of basically like from here to here. Uh, and so we need to figure out what that is in terms of theta max. So, um, so we need to do a little bit of geometry here. Um, and you know, a clever part of this is, is that the, at the max angle, the speed of the object is zero. And so we can do an energy equation and say, all right, at what point is the kinetic energy zero where all the energy is gonna be in potential? Okay, so now we're going to say this is the final. So this is the initial, this is the final. Um, so, so, you know, one of the ways we can do that is, is uh, the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. And the, the kinetic energy final, where the final is like the max angle, well, uh, that's when it's going to be at rest right, because it's, it's the max angle, it's converted all its kinetic energy into potential energy. Um, and then the, the potential energy change is just the change of the, of the heights, the heights, you know, the height above the ground. And then the initial kinetic energy, um, well, that's, that's going to be the speed, not necessarily the speed of the bullet, but the speed of the target right after it's been hit by the bullet. And so this has got to be true. The, the, the main thing we got to figure out now is how does VYF and VYI relate to, to the angle? And uh, so to do that, we need to just do a little bit of trig here and realize that, again, the chain, we're really looking for this as the change in height. And so if this is 0.5 meters, um, that gives us a kind of a triangle, right? So we can, we can if this is 0.5 meters, then this length from here up to here is cosine 0.5 meters. And so the change in height is going to be 0.5 meters minus 0.5 times the cosine of theta max. So that's gonna be the change in height. And so we can replace this, y final minus y initial, we can replace that with this. Um, and so when we put that into there, yeah, we just, so this is the, r minus r cosine theta thing. So you put that into here, and then, one, now, then once you figure out the velocity of the target, we stick that in here, and then we can solve for the mass of the target. Um, I forget what the exact number for the velocity of the target ends up being. Um, we can solve for the mass of the target, and we end up with eight kilograms. 
Is that really accurate? Is that really true? I don't really know, but it doesn't seem like it's crazy big or crazy small. So there you go. For what for what we were looking at in the video, that seems seems somewhat reasonable for what for what he was doing. So anyway, so that's that is the most interesting ballistic pendulum example that I could come up with for today's lecture. Seems reasonable to me, indeed. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is how to think about things in two and three dimensions. So thus far we've only been doing things that are sort of moving along a line. So, you know, there's that, there's the, the bullet that's hitting Captain America that's along a line. My little Nerf gun thing uh, with the foam pads, that was basically a one-dimensional situation. Um, but the world is three-dimensional and we need to be able to deal with problems in 2D and 3D. In fact, the, the the Planetoids with Momentum Lab, uh, I really like it so much because it's a two-dimensional momentum situation. So that's why I like it so much. Now, we talked a little bit about vectors in the beginning of the course. And uh, it turns out that you can write momentum conservation in the following way if all of these velocities are vectors. And all this means, this is a very fancy way of writing, of writing uh, this. So this, these two equations, is equivalent to this one equation. That's one of the reasons why physicists like vectors so much and engineers like vectors so much is because you can write one equation that really is shorthand for two, two equations. And so, you know, we, we, save, we avoid various levels of carpal tunnel syndrome by not uh, writing these down twice. Um, okay, so the, the group work for today it's a pretty fun thing. So I found this video. So this is a group of people in Pennsylvania that uh, for fun, they take Civil War type cannons and they fire them. So on some level they're like, I don't know that they're Civil War reenactors, but I guess they're um, something between history buffs and explosions and pyrot pyromaniacs. Um, but uh, the, the worksheet, the, the, the question on the worksheet is, saying how much should this thing slide back if it's firing if it's firing cannon not not horizontal to the ground but at some angle to the ground how much should that cannon kick back uh, and so let me turn my mic off so we can watch real the video quick. real quick recording One o'clock, <laughs> that far. Um, did you guys see the little groundhogs sort of running away from the cannon? Um, the uh, I feel bad for the groundhog. So, um, so here's the deal. So let's forget about the fact that there's wheels, and let's just imagine that this cannon is on like a block somehow, and the surface has. Uh, 0.3 as the coefficient of kinetic friction. And so the cannon's going to launch at some angle. Like from the video, to me, it looks like 14 or 15 degrees. Like it wasn't totally horizontal to the ground. And uh, the question is, how far will the cannon slide? Because, um, and the premise of the, of the worksheet is that we want to figure out how far should we stand back from this thing to make sure it doesn't hit us after it launches. Because it could go a long way, right? So we need to do this calculation. Um, and you could, do, you know, if it was if it was flat, you'd say, all right, well, the momentum is conserved. So initially, the momentum is zero, right? And then uh, the thing gets shot out this way. And so if the if the if the cannonball is going this way with some speed, then there's an equal amount of momentum going the opposite way. Um, but the thing you have to think about is that the cannonball is actually, you know, is actually at this angle. So not all of that, not all of that speed is in the x direction now. So, so that's what the worksheet is going to talk about, um, and you'll come up with some number and try to decide if that's how, if that's safe or not. So, um, so that's the challenge for today, um, the worksheet for today. So, um, I'll let you guys get to it.